case, unless there are any questions, which hopefully there are not. On the motion that this house believes that education systems in Africa should emphasize pan-African history and identities rather than national ones, I'd like to call upon Prime Minister to open the case for opening government. Here, here. <laughs> What matters is not what is presented, but what matters is what focus and what resources should be allocated to. On site opening government, we believe we should allocate our resources on the research, on the buildings of pan Africanism, because the discussion and discourse on pan Africanism is extremely limited in our discussions quo, and it increases the level of unity that can increase between people. So I would agree that there are symmetric level, perhaps a symmetric level of increasing level of unity on both sides, but the question is which resource should we allocate it to, to increase unity, but also to increase impacts. Three pieces of framing from site opening government. Let's talk about the implementation of pan-Africanism in education system. The first is that we will focus on research, academia internationally, being gathered under the African Union worldwide to discuss and build what pan-Africanism is, how it should be represented, more journals, more criticism, and more check and balance on the journals of pan-Africanism, discourse that would increase and such. Secondly, we will also hire experts from local communities, educated individuals from different communities, how we can cover different layers of different representations of individuals. The third is of you see, there are still attempt to unite and achieve some level of you know unity because a we focus on communality that we still pursue under the great banners of Africa how we are defined not by ourselves but also by our conquerors and such and the roots and the traditional uh, uh, traditionals that we can okay. also cover on our side but under a banner of Africa and the beauty of our differences that can also be covered what we will see change is a unity we recognize that there are differences on this but we would want to unite under one identity the second that there might be some identity that might not get covered but this is some relatively okay because we would focus on a very umbrella term, an umbrella forms of pan-Africanism. The comparative on-site opposition is abandoning those Africanism research, abandoning discourse and discussion for the sake of building nationality on the basis of each country's under Africa and be leaving little to no discourse and explorations upon Africanism to contribution. The first is how it builds national, how national identities tramples on the weakest and erase us of our identity and decrease unity. The second is how Pan Africa historically should be done through historical, yeah, through education and such, right? The first, let's talk about why national identity that is covered in education is going to be bad on site opposition. The thesis is we understand and have, uh, you know, PM that the greatest metal is going to be based on characteristic. So we're going to give you five structural reasons and characteristics why nationalism would be underrepresented under their side. The first is that you're going to focus on context of each specific country. History has shown that countries faces these types of countries faces post colonial conflict and shown that they also fight each other because of the fight and conquer method that is done by colonialists. The second is there are different struggles in between African countries, knowing the fact that they have different layers of slavery, for example, different layers of uh, struggles between each other due to the geographical differences, differences, who their conquerors are, who their colonizers are. The third is that culturally before there is struggle between them due to tribalism and such. The third is that within this country there are differences between tribes as well. So nationalism is hard to be done because you ought to erase one type of identity under their side and ought to focus on one. Why? Because after post-colonial country, most likely the elites and the you know individual that is most prevalent between the tribes are the individual who gets to build those ident national identity. Are the individual who gets to build uh, you know the greatest tribe, uh, the greatest tribe who has the privilege of building national identity. What yeah. history is get covered? So on their side, they're gonna erase some level of individuals, and most likely this would lead to erasure, right? Now, let's talk about the impacts of nationality. The first, we would say that it increases the struggle for unity. It increases the effort for things such as African unions that focuses on a one single nation, uh, that focuses on one single pan-African identity. The reason why this pan-African identity is incredibly important is A, because these countries are oftentimes not great economically. They need to unite and work together, and in order for them to work concurrently and con uh, concurrently between each other, they need to understand that they are commonality. The second is that oftentimes, right. because there are differences between tribes in one country, nationalism doesn't get to cover that, but Pan-African identity gets to cover a lot of identities under these tribes, right? I'm going to tell you why. 
Yeah. Thirdly, it's easier as well for future comebacks. So it's easier for things such as, you know, well, post colonial country to wage war against each other because they don't focus on the single unities and identities and such. The third is that generally it's harder to implement nationalist based identity on their side because you don't untie the forces between nationalism. There's little to no representation being done. Formalization of education gets harder because you focus on the single resources of one country as opposed to a whole pan African and a whole African yeah. continent focusing on increasing the education and history. Uh, yeah, before the closing. In which level of education is this implemented? This is a clarification, not a few. Oh yeah, every level of education, yeah. most likely like, you know, academia are pretty good at layering education in terms of difficulty. So in grade school, you're not going to be taught something too complex and such, right? Now, mm -hmm. let's talk about the second argument, which would be how would the focus on Pan-African identity increase this unity? The first is that generality, right? Because there are different tribes between one country, you focus on general things such as the color pigmentation of your skin, such as the fact that we are all victims of struggles of colonialism and slavery and such. And this is something that a lot of individuals can cover and focus on. The second is that it's easier for people to unite on the basis of this community, the quality and the power that we own back then, the glory of our nations and such, of our nations, of our identity. The second is that, the third is that there are more research being done on Pan-Africanism. Note that there are little to no interest being done on Pan-Africanism on site opposition as a comparative because, you know, most countries would just focus on their national identity and focus a lot of their resources on this. The third is that there are interest to intersect cross research, increase quality of education and history. Because researchers and educationers, you know, create curriculum that interact and criticize between each other, on their side there are massive interests to continuously build, criticize, check and balance the pan-African identity. So the comparative is on both sides, there might be some level of Pan-African identity because there are interests to unite you know, under African Union, but it is better on our side when it's formalized between education because there are efforts to continuously improve it. The way is not only that it increased unity, it increased the idea and the mobility to, in, uh, to increase the quality of buildings of Pan-African identity. What is the impact? The first is better interaction to mobilize between each other, so it's easier for you to interact between individuals under the Pan-African identity, even if they come from different background. The second is that the increase of politics and the representation of what being Pan-African is. It covers more ground, it covers more identity, more tribes on the side, because you invite more people, you ensure that the discourse on uh, formal discourse between history, the building of curriculums under our side, is increased when it is focused on. And the last is that it increases commonality. It ensures that even if we are different under difference between our tribes, between our struggles, and etc., that we are the same and we are once a glorious nation and we should focus on that. And the last is the ability to focus on greater economical advantages, things such as African unions, for example, better trade between each other because it's easier for us to know that we are of the same nations and such. On side of the government, sure, we are afraid that we are going against two African nations that are great teams, but at least we gave a very good effort. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for his fine speech, and I'd like to call upon the Leader of Opposition to begin the case for opening opposition. Here, here. I'm trying to take POIs from both sides. has always been on the necks of everyone to not generalize is that there's a conception that people are different, that countries are different, and for no reason should you lump them together just because you realize most of them are black or most of them do not speak English and so they are unified and they look the same and they are similar. We think that the only reason we unify is that we are different and there is something that one side has that the other side has. If we both have cocoa, there is no reason for us to like export cocoa to each other because we both have it. What it means is the only reason you trade with another country is that you accept that they have something that you don't. Why the hell will you exchange your cocoa for this? It's the same thing. What it means is this. On opposition, we say that to the worst of cases, the only reason we would unite is because we know one side has something that the other doesn't. Two things. First is, and don't let them lie to you, they only have one argument, which is unity, and impact swelling from it. First thing is this, all other 
other regional blocs are successful and they do not need to carve pan-Europeanism, pan-Asianism to have that unity among them. Europe has free trade. Like you have Schengen business, but they didn't need to do these things and teach everybody about Europe before they were able to do this. Two, their case is far from reality. There are things like ECOWAS, free trade exists in Africa. Don't let anybody lie to you in today's <coughs> world. These are things that are happening without these African identities being taught. The delta that they want to prove is small and meaningless, and I'll show you why they cannot win this debate. Two. Let me give more explicit responses to them. Two things. They say, well, countries are fighting each other in, in Africa. Two things. That's not true. Like, and that's the best response I can give. It's simply <laughs> not true. The, the conflicts you have in Africa are caused by Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, Biafra conflicts. These are internal country conflicts. That means that the reason African countries most of the time do not get to develop is that even when you get money from inter-country trade, you need to come and use it to fix security problems inside your country. Like in Nigeria, there's even no conception of what Nigeria really looks like and what it is because some people in Nigeria are not sure that they are Nigerian. Some people in Ghana are not sure that they are Ghanaians. They just happen to be in it. Which means that to an extent where we have not been able to properly form our national identities, it is nonsensical to say you want to approximate to a higher national uh, identity. This is why it is important. Two things. Our case on opposition and our stance is to say that when we teach people to focus more nationally, they are more likely to buy into things like um, Pan-Africanism anyway because if I love Ghana and Ghana wants to cooperate with Nigeria and South Africa, as a patriotic Ghanaian, I will buy into it because it is an extended function of the love of my country. It means that we co-opt their impact when you focus on it. But we think that our impact is better because I'm able to cooperate with other people from other tribes in Ghana and not focus on a superficial Nigerian and uh, 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 African identity. Secondly, and I think that's why COSPY is important. Because what it does is that if you are going to teach children these things, children need to understand to be tolerant to the people right next to them instead of imagining being tolerant to someone in Kenya. We think that when you do this and you are able to coagulate, two things happen. One, assuming unity is an impact that can happen on both sides. This is why ours is better. First thing, their impact of free trade, free travel, those things happen already. And so it is not a unique in, in, in impact. Our impact is that people stop intercultural wars that prevent states from being able to have good international image. That's why we can't even get loans and grants. That's why we don't even get FDIs. Because people know that African countries have conflict in them. Not that even though we are united as AU and we are even planning to have our own banks, have our own currency, we still don't get in investment because people know that we are shitholes and they cannot protect their investments because of political instability. What it means is we allow the expansion of all the impacts that they have if our countries are fully formed. If you look at mine, look at EU. Secondly, we see that most of the time, the cause of ignoring these specific issues comes to watch minority identities and erase them through a unique ethnic cleansing mechanism. Realize, because what you do is that you have to focus on big countries like Nigeria, big countries like uh, Morocco, who have capital to be able to invest in their research and everything they talk about. Those countries have no reason to invest in smaller African countries or smaller African identities. Do you know why? Most of the time, those countries have even ignored them and they are dying and nobody really cares about them. On our side, we say we let them be more inward looking and be more concerned about this. This impact over acts everything because we say that when you are able to localize and develop, you can now coagulate and get more factors such that you don't need to spend so much on internal security while you are trying to create good external energetic growth. So given that to a large extent, the problem that a lot of Africans face, be it internally or externally, is that they do not conceive that their identity is one that is important. 
how do you head against the white imperialism that goes on there? Yeah, the reason white imperialism exists is that they think we are all the same. And so what they can do for the other one, the other ones have to appreciate. That's what we've been fighting against, that we are all different. You can't give one a, a cocoa plant and say that we all need it. We think that when you are able to lump us together, we are more easily disrespected because everybody realizes these people are not unique. The reason Africans are fighting for more tourist gains, for more investment, is that we want everyone to accept that our economies are different. There are different kinds of investments you can do in Africa. We have different resources. We have different cultures. We have different story sites. Realize, Paul, because to an extent where we focus on how our countries are different, people have unique reasons. And that's why someone will say, oh, I'm coming to Africa. And ask them where. They're coming to Nigeria or South Africa. Because they don't know any shit about any African country. And they think it's just the same. And, and, and like, Africa is pretty much the same. They all live in villages. And so any village I go, the other village most likely looks the same. What we do on our side is that we force everyone to um, to out um, to see the differences and uniqueness of us. It even goes into how EPR debaters relate with us. If they realize that my country is different and has unique issues, they're not going to lump us together with other African countries. We think that this is better because when people realize that their uniqueness is being appreciated, they are able to have a better worldview. We see to an extent where people have died to secure their unique identities today, they should not have their identities forgotten because of a superficial principle. Proud open. I'd like to thank the Leader of Opposition for the fine speech, and I'd like to call upon the Deputy Prime Minister to continue the case for open government. Here, here. <laughs> Start, like if there's any other like, ringtones that are still on, please turn off. Um, starting my speech in three, two, one. So the biggest premise from OO that I think you might encounter is that if we make it a pan-African history, it'll focus on certain big nations, they will have certain bias. What they fail to take into account is that they themselves acknowledge within a singular nation there are several different ethnicities, identities, and tribes that are cobbled together. That was to say, on their side of the house, in the history of Ghana, there's no one Ghanaian people. There are still different ethnicities, tribes, and a minority within a minority in their, in the, within their nation. So their benefit of national identity being possible or perfect is still something you cannot achieve because the elite are the ones that are defining it. I'm going to go more into why mechanistically this is going to be the case and why comparatively if we make the discussion of history between nations, it is a stronger check and balance system and will not allow these echo chambers to exist. With that, res direct responses to their side of the house. First, they talk about how it makes you look similar. First, we question though, when you do end up being different, what is still then the incentive for trade either? If national and history and national history and pride is very, very strong, that is also potentially not gonna make them wanna trade. If they portray their history, their cocoa as the strongest one in all of Africa, why would they sell it to other countries? Why would other countries sell it? Why would they buy it from other countries as well? So this is something that is quite symmetrical and there's a the house. Second, as far as internal conflicts, we agree it happens, but what is their conflict resolution on their side? They are still reliant then on individual nations using their individual pool of resources and security. On our side, because of the sense of unity, you are then much more likely to help out your fellow African nation because you believe you came from the same history, you believe that you should be united, and you believe that you are intertwined historically. So you should help them. When Boko Haram attacks one country, it is not just that country's problem, it's the whole of Africa's problem. That's why we will help them on our side. Not yet. I'll take it from the closing later on. Thirdly, when they then talk about, well, trade will happen anyway. One, we already talked about how within national identity, this makes it, they, they concede that it is possible for them to increase the level of trade on our side of the house. Second of all, it's actually less possible on their side between each nation because, as you mentioned, national history and pride could make them either too prideful or spiteful towards another nation because of the divide, divide and conquer, which I'll get into right now. How did the edu educational system work? We already talked about we are going to have checks and balances in the creation of it. Most likely the discussion of this will, will be comprised of the most educated people within the whole of Africa. 
people who have higher education, who have been exposed to things like the idea of merit, fairness, and liberalism, that is going to make sure that they are going to think about other nations and other people when they are making this discussion. We are going to use third party external audits, for example. So when they talk about folks on big countries, that's not likely to happen. Because we also have the incentive to make the education as objective as possible. We'll use technocrats within, of, of all the nations within Africa, pull them together so resource-wise, the history and the quality of the history is better. It's not going to be one-sided, where it's potential for a one specific government, because on their side, if they say this is possible, this is also going to be possible locally. What we're going to focus on and things like the, the fact that we're all victims of colonization, and second of all, even the history of kings and the prosper of Africa to make them think that if we work together, we can make our, country, our, our, whole, our whole continent much stronger as a whole. Which, at which levels this engages with, with CO? First, at all levels, which means that one, it is something gradual. It's something you get used to over time. It's something incremental. It might not implement directly right now, but if we accrue that benefit in the future, that's fine. Yeah. Second of all, it means that it's for long-term benefits. Thirdly, even if it's even if there's some level of cognitive dissonance within the current generation and the next generation, that's fine. These are all growing pains that we're going to take into account. Why are we willing to trade off slash say that national identity is not something that opposition can actually do? First, it's still impossible to achieve. On opposition, each individual nation is still comprised of different ethnicities, tribes, and indigenous groups. So on their side, if they blame us and focus on big countries, they are going to focus on the dominant tribe and the dominant ethnicity within one nation, for example, the specific elite in a specific country. Why? Because it was done historically. The colonizer used the divide and conquer tactics to put different ethnici uh, ethnicities and tribes against one another. This has translated to when they were able to achieve independence, those historical grievances between nations that were fueled by the colonizer's interest is something that continues to fester on cop, on off. So the struggle to create this identity is symmetric. But it's worse on opposition because you can't fully achieve perfect representation anyway of identities within a singular nation. Even us from Indonesia share the same problem. However you try to spin it, a specific culture, Japanese culture, Sumatran culture will still dominate over other cultures that exist. So perfect national identity is not a benefit you should count on opposition. What's the difference though? On governments of the house, you have entirely different nations who check and balance each other, who discuss. We don't allow a single echo chamber within a singular nation to happen. If the smaller countries, for example, they believe, are not satisfied, then we'll continue the discussion. And we already talked about how most likely these are technocrats, people who are educationally, educationally very savvy, so they have the interest to find this common ground. The conclusion is unity is possible, and the incentive exists is on our side of the house, on opposition, the national identity that's their benefit is not going to happen anyway. Before I get to the impacts on the way, I'll take closing. Higher education is probably not comparative. History majors still probably exist, specialists still probably exist. This is what primary education focuses on that. Yeah, even, even then, even when it's at any level, we're talking about the precursor to any benefits or any harms of this debate, which is the creation of the curriculum that is included in the historical system. We're saying the people who are the most educated are the, the ministries of education for all of them. The technocrats for all of Africa, they are the ones combining, making sure that the history is something that is most representative. It might be trading off some smaller identities. We agree. On opposition, they have to trade it off as well. They cannot possibly say that each every single nation will represent every single minute, small ethnicity within Africa itself. No country has achieved this unless you are a unified country. And we've characterized to you how Africa, how a lot of countries in Africa are victims of colonizers, who are victims of divide and conquer, who are separated between their ethnicity, and when they were put together, they were a cobbled project rather than a true representation of one singular nation. So the impact that we were able to achieve on OG. One, commonality, sense to need to work together to make sure that the African Union in the future is gonna work better. Second of all, this is important because economically, these countries are incapable of putting up a very good bargaining position against other countries. That's why, for example, countries like China have been able to come in because the African Union have not been relevant enough in the status quo. So the way for this is one, we mechanize how the educational system is likely to be fair and how the creation of the history is going to be balanced, the most important debate. This take up Ops' biggest concern about being biased one way or another, and even then, they have to deal with it if they're willing to take the scenario. And even when the trade we traded off, we were saying it's still okay because it's for the benefit of unity, something more important than just a national identity, which they cannot achieve as well. By closing, we'll have a hard time extending as one. The process of how history is created, the prerequisite for all benefits and harms in this debate have already been completely mechanized on OG. Second of all, the outcome itself, unity for Pan-Africa, reducing grounds for conflict, is something that OG has also already impacted for all those reasons. Very proud of the place. 
I'd like to thank the Deputy Prime Minister for his fine speech, and I'd like to call upon the Deputy Leader of Opposition to continue the case for open opposition. Here, here. So, um, and I'll pray to give you for good teams. I'll pray guys closing if I'm out of time. In three, two, one. In this tournament, a lot of people are generally referred to as, as Africans. I mean, it shouldn't be helpful, it shouldn't be hurtful. But then every time I go to sleep, I sleep wondering why we have Spanish, we have people from USA, we have Ireland, but then all of us are not, all of us are Africans, and I'm not Ghanaian, and other people are not Nigerians, Senegalese, etc. For us, we've lost our expression, and we think that it's maximized if you emphasize on any other thing that proves that we are one and similar. What is Oji's response to this? Oji says that if you if you denounce like Pan Africanism, it means you lose all your similarities. If you denounce Pan Africanism, colonization is still exists, its memory and its effects are still there. If you denounce Pan Africanism, everything that makes Africans similar is going to exist. We just say that we do not, I mean, feed it into the problems in status quo. We are more liberating for Africa. But then, what does OG assume? I think OG assume that without the idea of Pan Africanism and emphasizing on it, you can never achieve anything in Africa. So things like they argue that oh, Pan Africanism gives, gives us unity, Pan Africanism gives us small trade, Pan Africanism, Pan -Africanism like solve the internal conflict. It's just a, a generalization that they fail to prove. Even if they give you structural like, reasons, it has not really engage the issue. The first response is that every other continent or every other regional bloc have been able to do some of these things, and they are not dependent on Pan Euro. They are not dependent on any other like. That's like Africa. We don't get why only Africa should get all of these things with, with, when they focus on Pan Africanism. But then, secondly, the first speaker tells you on our side that all of these things are happening. Equus and um, the African free trade, like Ghana has bilateral deals with Cote d'Ivoire on how to sell like, their cocoa. All of these things are happening and they are on the right because Africans know that they have to do this together. We don't get why, I mean, Pan Africanism is the delta that makes all the benefits like on tempos. They need to explain why, if without Pan Africanism, all of these things cannot happen. We say that it's happening. Start to school, we don't emphasize on Panafricanism. These things can happen. Don't let them deceive you that it cannot happen and without Panafricanism, Africa will never grow. Africa is going quite and well. But also, if you agree that forging, like forging a national identity is important, you can't be the side that is advocating that we should ignore national identity and focus on Panafricanism. Because we say that national identity is important and it's logically prior to any other benefit you can get on the African continent. And this is even like and this is even why we win today's debate because we argue that for all the benefits that every team can claim. Even if like CEO, everything can claim. If you do not focus on carbon national identity, you lose all of these particular benefits, and that's why we think like it's like necessarily important, right? The other thing that I'm going to discuss then is that um what, why do you know about like CEO? I think the show is going to from their two are going to have a chat on a, a implementation, so it's going to most likely do back. We argue that even if it's done good, which is when OG mechanisms are correct, or even if it's done terrible, which is when CEO's mechanisms are correct, it's still terrible and we still need to be able to not do these things if we want to develop our case logically prior to every benefit that every team is going to defend in today's way. And that's why we break into that particular final. What is the comparative on our side? When we don't emphasize it, we let countries do what I mean they want to do, right? We have already argued that that will not cancel out benefits like trade, bilateral deals, all of those things. Those things are growing in Africa and those things are most likely going to work out um, in that regard. So we argue that countries are most likely going to pursue like nationalism because it's the most proximate thing to them. So individuals wake up and they identify themselves like, as countrymen, as ethnic groups. We need to resolve the internal conflict before we look outside in that regard. We are going to engage like three things. One status quo conflict in Africa and the last thing is one expression, closing. So the problem with your case is that this education is being done internally. So you are not teaching the white man that I am different from him. You are teaching the same black man that I am different from him. I already fucking know this. What changes? Yes, I'm, so I'm, I'm not going to explain when I'm engaged like status quo. So two things in status quo. I think first thing that people don't generally know a lot of about, about the differences in Africa. So they lump all of us together. But secondly, they don't want to know because there's an easier notion that, I mean, there is one Africa. The problem with what he's saying is that if you indoctrinate children, if you teach them to emphasize that particular Pan-Africanism, when they migrate to other countries, that's what they sell. They sell Pan-Africanism, which means that you feather whatever is bad that's happening in status quo. People do not want to know. And when they interact with your own people, that you are feeding them with these things and getting these people like, mean that they are most likely going to equally sell Pan African rhetoric that increases all the harms in status quo because people don't want to know the differences. And even your next generation, you have taught them to equally focus on Pan Africanism, so they are selling this on the outside. 
I think they, they cannot they need to like win this case, they need to prove that Africans will never interact with the Western world. Because if you teach them that Pan-Africanism, when they interact, they're going to die based on Pan-Africanism and not unique differences. And the house of lamping Africa together is still going to exist. People don't care, the people who know to know the differences in that particular like that. The second chapter is on conflict in Africa. I think several things. First of all, conflict in Africa is not because of countries fighting um, another country. This is why it is true, and this is open like structural reasons as to why Africa will still develop regardless of Pan-Africanism. First of all, there is more push for African countries to work together to fight like um, issues that are um, bothering them. Without Pan-Africanism, these issues are bothering them. They are still going to come together and they are going to work. It's unclear to me why you know that you have to collaborate, collaborate with Côte d'Ivoire to be able to and gain maximum profit from your gold. But they say that because they are not going to take Pan-Africanism, you say I'm not going to collaborate with them. It's very, very unclear. Secondly, there is even more push for countries to form like regional blocks in so far as they maximize their gains from their ports, maximize their gains from their common goods that they trade. And thirdly, like there, there are bilateral trade users existing within Africa. We observe two things. First of all, unity is already in Africa, opening that men's delta is very small. But secondly, I mean, the world will still exist and Africa will still develop regardless of these things. I think the third thing then is that Conflicts in Africa are mostly because of like the pre-colonial contest. One, where they are that ethnic groups and they are fighting among themselves. But secondly, when like arbitrary like drawing and statehood enforced on them, this means that they were never able to conceptualize to come together as a community to form states. It was enforced on them. All of these things are the reason why like Africa is not developing and their internal conflicts. On our side, we say let countries focus on these things, let countries solve these things. That was like that they are still going to want to engage as other countries. But when we solve these things, that's when development can be incremental. So when states are Built, when roads are built, people don't fight and destroy them in that particular regard. I think the other thing then is that on our side, when we get these things, we have a better movement for Africa to be able to do it when you don't focus it. And then the last thing, which is my extension as DPM, is the idea of expression. First of all, how you express yourself is dependent on the first thing that is most proximate to me. Like the first thing that is most proximate to me as an individual is not necessarily the superficial concept of the state, but the superficial, the, I think the first thing is like you went, the community you were, you were born into, like the ethnic groups and the um, cultural differences that are surrounding you. Then the next thing that approximates to you more, like the state that you come from, before like the third thing that comes is necessarily like the continent. On our side, people get more expression and they get the ability to express themselves at tournaments like WDC and other tournaments in the fact they know that they are being taught to focus on their country, you are going to see me and call me a Ghanaian and not see me and call me Ghana. So if you want a team that gives you much more expression, you have to vote open operation into the final. The reason why we win and why our things are more important is that first of all, we identify that the most important thing for you to be able to do as an African country is to one, allow your people to express themselves. For so long, these particular people have been shackled, they've been lumped together. It's unclear why you want to stop not solve one problem but focus on any other thing. Most importantly, all our arguments are logically prior to any development that anything wants to claim for Africa. It's logically prior to any other thing about how like, this incremental success and how this imp implementation happens, probably opening opposition. I'd like to thank the Deputy Leader of Opposition for his final speech, and I'd like to call upon the Member of Government to begin the case for closing government. Hear, hear. <laughs> Panel, unlike the West, education is not a free for all in Africa. Literacy rates are very low, and at best, educational su su success is an aspirational option. What does this mean? It means that we don't really have a lot of people subscribing to education. And that means that the bulk of the impacts that the opening house de debates today are one that are large enough to materialize. But a few that even subscribe to education usually fall into two categories. There are people who eventually choose to fly out of Ghana, fly out of Nigeria because of brain drain and the opportunities that are right, rampant in the West. So it means that their, their ability to impact their states are usually minimal. But the remaining that stay are usually the ones that climb through the echelons of power to become policymakers and to become the powerful few that exist within the states. 
Why is this important and what's the implication of this argument? It means one, the knowledge of we are different from other people is not one that actually goes to everyone like they claim because it's just a few people that get educated in the long run. So that great impact that they say they want to achieve is one that does not become manifold. So sure, you might get 20% of Ghanaians knowing that we are different from the Americanization, but the remaining 80% who do not go to school, do not get the opportunity to get this level of education on their, on their side, so that impact is in of itself unachievable and unattainable. But again, we think that this means that the select few that constitutes the policy Makers largely do not have any huge interest in particularly participating in this because of the barriers that already exist to educate you about how different you are. What are these barriers? This looks like your family probably telling you that you are Ghanaian and there is something about your Akan culture which particularly stems from your name. This looks like your community who think that they can teach you who you are and the kind of things that you should value. Your value systems which are radically different from Northern Africans. So these things exist in status quo. We don't think that any Ghanaian particularly needs to know that they are Ghanaian and they are not broadly pan-African. So that level of burden that they place in this debate is probably a war if you particularly dissect it. It means that the real burden that exists in today's debate is the ability of policymakers and the ability of individuals who get to pass through these educational institutions and these educational um, systems to be able to impact this, uh, like the knowledge they get from either pan-Africanism or national identity into many of these spaces. But beyond that, let's first question exactly what constitutes the national identity of a lot of states. We think, for a lot of states, what constitutes their national identity beyond ethnic conflict that everybody in the open house talks about is largely colonialism. That is why, to a large extent, the French colonialists have created a situation where every single French colonial state thinks that the most important thing about them is the fact that they were colonized by the French individuals. We think what this does is that it largely inhibits the ability to create any level of cooperation between the broader level of unionization that exists. This is why, a large, to a large extent, the AU does not work. This is why ECOWAS does not work. Because when they bring up brilliant policies like the African Free Trade Agreement, countries like Morocco, countries like Egypt, say they are not African. And because they are not African, they cannot interact with that kind of education. They cannot interact with that kind of policy in that regard. What this means then is that the thing that wins, the thing that wins this debate is the thing that hedges best against this kind of imperialism and the conceptualization of who we are and the kind of identity that we particularly posit in that regard. Why is this particularly something that we deal with in today's debate? My speech is largely going to do like particularly with how we particularly um, like eradicate Western imperialism in the minds of African individuals, and secondly, why the counterfactual is particularly bad. But before I continue, I'll take open. You are being disingenuous to this debate because education is growing in Africa. So for these people think they are French because they've not conceptualized being Togolese. It means that when you localize, yeah, you see, like this is the problem with their speech here. Yeah? They particularly assume that I have to think that I am Togolese first before I think that I am African. We think that every other thing that exists in your community freaking tells you you are Togolese. We think that your name at the most basic point tells you you are Togolese. He is called Kojo. I am called Shebun. I know I am fucking Nigerian. I don't need education to tell me I am Nigerian. That burden is unimportant in the debate. Let's engage like policy and how that particularly changes in this regard. We think that to a large extent, the reason why a lot of policies that seek to promote African, prom uh, African like development in of themselves fail is because to a large extent there's a huge uh, there's a huge um, problem of like um, of, of like coagulation and cooperation. Recognize we do agree that this theme at best it's a theme comes from opening government, but we'll show you how we win it over them. We think that the reason why these things happen is because to a large extent, due to the manner in which colonialism worked out, there was an inability for states to be able to understand the possibility of cooperation that could exist between themselves and other states. However, how is this dealt with with this particular line of education? We think that what education does is, at this point is that it teaches them that before the white man came into the picture, you already held a broad and bigger identity above your national identity, which was African. How does this happen? We think that this looks like particularly giving them illustrations in their books about individuals like Shaka Zulu from South Africa, even though they are Nigerian. We think what this particularly does is that it shows them that beyond like having great white men who solved problems in the world and particularly created something in that space, you already had people outside of your local demography. What does this mean? It means that in terms of policy, you would have more interactions because they know that there's someone outside of my local demography who could probably understand this better than I did because they've particularly better gone through 
through all these kind of things. Why is this particularly unique to our side in this debate? We think it's particularly unique impact because to a large extent, what typically happens is that even though we suffer similar problems, we do not have similar grounds upon which these problems should be solved. Why? Because we think that our best solution is to freaking opt into Bretton Woods agreements and Bretton Woods institutions. That is why Ghana is going to opt to go into the IMF and not particularly have interactions with states that have gone through similar like um, inflation, inflation problems that they've gone through. We think what you do then is that you create a better ground for an understanding of the dynamics that went into many of these local spaces and made them work. We think that on the flip side, if you go for the national identity, a lot of states will look for internal solutions to their problems to the extent of not particularly interacting with other African states. The alternative, when they fail, because more often than not they do fail, is that they ask for Bretton Woods institutions like the World Bank, like the IMF, who give them structural adjustment policies that fucks them over. We think the inability to re remove the concept of the white savior is one that we need to particularly clamp down against in today's debate to be able to create a world where we have better solutions in that regard. But beyond that, recognize that to a large extent, a, a portion of Africa already believes that they are not African. Any rulers from Egypt, any rulers from like Northern Africa in that regard. What you do in the debate when you particularly offer this particular like um, point of view is that you create an opportunity to reintegrate and tap into the resources that are existing in these spaces. We think that's something that you uniquely get from our side that you don't get from open government. We think we win today's debate because we properly contextualize today's debate. They tell you nothing about the impacts of education. They just run on research. Today's debate can't fucking care about research. It's been already. I'd like to thank the Member of Government for the fine speech, and I'd like to call upon the Member of Opposition to begin the case for closed conversation. <laughs> in the West perceives Africa depending on how on African internal policies on their own education. Secondarily, there is um, there is a lot of linking required with the motion that is just not present on why this is going to be. Thirdly, on the, on the points about expressions depending on the one of the state come very late and late uh, like a lot of new ones. First, there's a framing that has been not present within this debate. Firstly, this is about primary schools. We POI this twice, we don't get a realistic answer. All do agree, they don't show what is the nuance and what this looks like. This is the first time you learn history, right? When you're in primary school, you're like 10, 11, 12, right? This is the first time you're engaged with the history of whatever area you want, on both sides of the house. This problem means that uh, this also means that we still have still history majors in college. This was it's probably not the most comparative thing. People still go to college. People still go get very specialized degrees. There are very specialized papers, right, on Pan-African history on both sides of the house. This is probably not within the motion. Secondarily, this is extremely important to note. If you want to learn about Pan-African history, that means that your educational system, when you're 12, when you're 13, needs to cover all of the history of Africa from Egypt to the South African Republic, right? This means that you probably have a lot of ground to cover and not a lot of time to do it. This probably means that learning a bit about every country, a bit about shared history, means at the detriment of learning a lot about your nuanced history of your own nation. It means not learning about specific people who worked in your country. Everybody learns about Nelson Mandela, but not everybody is going to learn about that specific feminist actor that existed 60, 70 years ago, because this is just no time for this to get into the foreign problem, right? It's also probably, this debate is also probably not about the African Union economic partnerships. Why? Because they have economic incentives. They're to exist on both sides of the house because they, all of these countries still want to profit of, of trading with each other. This also probably means this is the same for Egypt and Morocco that Egypt want to bring. They, they don't uh, opt in because they don't think they're African. They opt in because they don't think it's going to be economically profitable for them. This is unlikely to change on both sides of the house. Now, what's important within this debate? One, identity is extremely important for the individuals. OG, mention that, don't, don't, don't show why. Uh, um, uh, Oh, and oh, you mentioned that don't show why it's important. Secondarily, outside perception, we are actually going to link on how and why it changes. Firstly, on the idea of identity, right? People want to relate to the people that are physically proximately close to them, right? For the people who are their neighbors, for the people who are the who they grew up with. Note, this flag stands there for a reason. I'm wearing this, this shawl for a reason, because I 
believe that parts of my identity are connected to whence I came from, locally and specifically. Not Yugoslavia, not Europe, right? Not the West or the Eastern entity, specifically local patriotism that exists within an individual because they, this is the most proximate. Because this means I can now relate to the person who grew up next to me. I can now relate to my parents. This is what's different. See, you want to say, oh, but it's all broadly colonialism, so we can interact with that, right? No, it's not. It means that me, uh, my family suffered under the same as specific sure. people that your family suffered. This means that specific people who, to, who uh, imposed slavery on me imposed it on you as well. This is different from French colonies to, the, to Dutch colonies sure. to, to other colonies that may exist, right? Meaning that this means that it is not symmetric in every country that exists within Africa. But furthermore, this probably means that you feel loved, you feel understood. When you sing a song about a specific country you come from, you probably feel a lot more attention to the people who are singing Nigeria, who are singing Ghana, and if people are broadly chanting Africa. Because you as a Nigerian probably don't feel as connected to people in Egypt as you do with people who grew up in the same city as you did. CG mechanize this, right? They say your name reflects where you are. Your, you are, your parents reflect where you come from, right? Your songs relate to where you come from, right? People in Egypt and Morocco want to feel like they're from Egypt and Morocco and they're within this debate. They do not want to feel like Africans by their own by their own virtue of CG making that see Egypt and Morocco don't feel like Africans, right? Furthermore, the state has a duty, uh, the, a duty to maximize my ability to achieve happiness. Given that we've shown that your local identity is likely one of the metrics that you use to achieve happiness, one of the metrics that is very proximate to both you and the people that you grew up with, the people you want to relate to, both, ge you, both uh, those who are close to you approximately and those who are genetically tied to you, the state has a duty to maximize my ability to do so. Note why this is important. The state controls all of the aspects of my existence, education being one of the most proximate ones here, meaning that the, the, the things that the state teaches me to, uh, teaches me in schools is something I have no recourse towards. I didn't choose what the state is going to teach me. I'm too young. I'm still, at, I'm still attending, uh, attending these schools. The state had then has a duty to say that they will teach me things that are most likely to maximize my own happiness, considering that right. identity is going to be extremely important. My ability to dignify, live a dignified life, my ability to decide what happiness means for me, and have the maximum possible tools to achieve this is extremely important. Therefore, the state has a duty to allow me to access national identity, national pride to the extent that it's going to be meaningful to me as an individual, it's going to be meaningful to me when I'm creating relationships with people around me. Furthermore, this is likely to create backlash. This backlash is going to be an extremely important point, it's going to weigh off in this debate. For go on opening. Don't you think that this is symmetrical with every type on your side under nationalism? There are thousands of tribes and culture within one country with one elite who dominate which has been mechanized. OG is the only thing who recognizes this harm and minimizes this with cross-functional warfare. I, I am unsure what specific this means. We show you why specific harms exist once you're pushing against national identity. There's no. But how does backlash look like? This means that your parents are probably telling you, look, we are Nigerian, look, we are from Bikira Faso, look, we are from Laos. This is specific things that you're being taught when you're home. But when, they, when the point when you get to school and you realize that the most important thing that's being taught to you is the idea that you are a pan-African, that this is the history that exists, there's probably a lot of cognitive dissonance. Why are they not talking about the people that my parents are talking about are important. Why is this not the thing, right? Furthermore, my parents are probably going to be very bad. This is exactly what happened in Yugoslavia when they taught Yugoslav history over specific national history. This is my grandfather going to school and his dad saying, why are they not teaching me about our present? Why are they not teaching me about our kings? Why are they not teaching me about the people who brought up Croatian country or Serbian country or uh, analogically within this debate, right? These, if, so if CG want to say, oh, but literacy is low, literacy is bad, this is either symmetric or more, even more realistically, more, uh, there is more buy-in into education on side clothes and composition. Because if people don't believe, if like literacy is already low, if people already don't want to go into schools, it's more likely that they're going to opt out even further at the point where they believe that the schools are teaching something that they do not agree with, that, that the schools are teaching something that is going to that is going to lower, uh, that is not realistic to what they believe that their history should be. Furthermore, this increases brain drain. Note that African countries have a different degree of wealth, right? Burkina Faso is much poorer, uh, much poorer than Nigeria is or than South Africa is. To that extent, there is a significant amount of brain drain to the richer countries. At the point where people do not feel like kinship to their own national identity, they are more likely to buy into things such as brain drain and go into richer countries. This is bad because economic harm still is further propagated to, country, uh, to uh, less developed country, right? This also means propagates economic differences for the future. And for uh and furthermore, um, and furthermore, this probably things such as Western perception, right? Because Western perception can change only when national culture changes, when people make movies about specific figures that are important in your, in your history, and they only do this once they feel they have an emotional connection to these people. For these most proud of us.
I'd like to thank the members of opposition for the fine speech. I'd like to call upon the government to work to close off the case of closing government. stumbling block to development in most African countries is the massive amount of imperialism that exists within African states, the ability for the West to constantly oppress us. The reason why we solve this uniquely from closing government is because opening government only says, oh well, now these countries want to cooperate. But these guys say, oh well, they already exist things like AU, they already exist things like ECOWAS. Why do we better ensure that these bodies function maximally? Because Prosper explains in his speech that on our side of the house, what it then looks like is that the reason why this body is able to function optimally is because most of the, most of the countries believe that most of the reason why they are suffering, the voter base understands that most of the reasons why they are suffering is because the West and other imperialistic bodies are denying them for the ability to self-determine. So what does it specifically look like in terms of voting? So most of these countries know that the reason why I'm unable to sell my cocoa or my natural resource is because the West is detecting how I should sell it, right? And most of these guys understand that this is the issue and that's why I'll vote for politicians that are, that are likely to push for these things. That means that we are the ones that will mechanize the coagulation and that will mechanize the cooperation that exists among these countries. Opening governments does not do that and that's why we are clearly taking the debate from them. But then let's go to personal position and firstly take them out. They say, oh well, individuals are going to forget our national identity. Note that things like mass media exist, their national holidays that exist, families will teach you about these things. So I don't think there's going to be that massive forgetfulness as they try to explain within their speech. And that's very ridiculous. So they say, oh well, prior to backlash these people, right? We can easily explain that, oh well, we just want to create a unified identity, especially when most of these guys feel that they are underrepresented. They know that when the next government comes, Christians are going to come into power. When the next government comes, Muslims are going to come into power. So they are not going to hedge against these things because they feel that, well, they can just create some sustainable that everybody can ascribe, that everybody can ascribe to. That means that parents are likely to understand these things and know that this is for the better good. I don't know why Seawalk has a case within today's debate. They say, oh well, these countries need to understand the specific nuances that led to colonization. So, for example, Dutch countries can know that Dutch colonial, uh, close colonial countries can know that this was a specific way that we were colonized by the Dutch and the English and the Spanish, whatsoever. Know that their side still creates and attaches the idea of divide and conquer. Why? Because when they go to international bodies like the UN, etc., these guys will come to the Dutch countries, try to negotiate something with them, and for the English and for the French. That means that they still divide and conquer us on our side. You have the lowest common denominator that all these guys can push on, and that means that they have higher bargaining power on our side. That means that on our side, we're able to properly mobilize and attack these imperialistic guys. I don't think they're able to achieve that on their side of the house. But they say, oh, well, like they're still going to engage in this, like in this bodies because of economic benefits. So Morocco still wants to opt into the AU because of economic benefits. Note that these politicians engage in these bodies because people on the ground are voting for these things. In the world where people on the ground feel that I'm not African enough, or even though I'm Moroccan, I'm not African enough, enough and stuff like that. These politicians are unable to then opt into these things, especially when people vote on most things like their identity and stuff like that. In the world where people feel their identity is not proximate to the larger identity, then they are still not going to opt into these things. Close the position does not have a case within today's debate. Let's go to opening government. I'm going to engage them on three levels. Like firstly, on unification. I have two observations here. Firstly, countries unite based on similar goals and aspirations. So you cannot argue that their differences is what's going to make them unite. In the world where we make it apparent to them that you have similar goals, you have similar aspirations, because the reason why you are here is because a white man came to plunder you, then you are more likely to unite on outside the house. But then secondly, Oh, I explain that unification still exists in the status quo. That unification is redundant because most countries are selfish. And this is this is reflected when you go to things like the UN. Countries like African countries should not vote together. They don't come together and vote because all of them are selfish and they all push for their individualistic things. On our side, we tell them, the voter base tells them through their votes that oh, well, the reason why I'm suffering is because of the white man. And that means that politicians when they go there are likely to vote against the against the white man, which is mechanized from the ability to coagulate as African leaders, and that's why we clearly win on that. Second thing they argue is about conflict. Not 
that there's no clear like definition of national identity on that side of the house, right? Why is this likely to be the case? Because it's like religion, things like ethnicity, are things that are fickle and it eventually can can lead to lack of representation of multiple groups. Vicious. That means that they are not really comprehensive in terms of their arguments. Vicious. But secondly, uh, but Africanism is more encompassing and has the ability to be able to properly sustain. How? Through things like movies and pop culture and Black Panther. Through like people like people, more people from other countries sign up to these things. That means that this form of identity is one that can be sustained and can lead to more stability within these countries. What is this extremely very important? Because the major another major reason why African countries are not developing is because of the instability that exists in these places. Countries now want to come and invest because they feel that these places are not sustainable. In a world where I preach them a more unified and a more encompassing identity that is likely to be long term because of the mechanism I'm giving to you, they are able to attract this form of investment, they are able to have more stable African countries. That's a unique benefit that we are not on our side. Yes. It's opening op opposition. You ignore two things. One, not every country on your side would still ratify every international agreement on the AU. That's, a, that's how confederation works, and it's fine. But secondly, when you emphasize for Africanism, you dwindle nationalism. That's yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, it's sort of comparative, right? How are you likely to ensure that countries ratify this agreement? You know, one way people are voting because they feel that we need to unite, then countries are more likely to do that, right? Like, secondly, like, Second thing I prove to you is that this response about how Pan Africanism is likely to be more sustainable is important, right? Because you you can't you don't need to necessarily solve internal issues to be able to move to external issues and this guy to make it seem. You can easily just jump a gun by moving to a more unified approach where individuals can coordinate, right? I don't know why you need to solve internal before going to external. That's some weird logic that you need to punish them for. The last thing I'm going to I'm going to talk about here is that in the civil war, we have massive differences and we need to be able to show that we need to know that we are unique, right? Like the comparative is that. People are more clamped down on your side of the house because the majority of group or national identities can be formed around Christianity or Islam or whatever national identity. So they are not really comparative in their arguments, right? So people are more excluded on their side of the house, right? Then what's their way to this argument? They say we need to show our differences because we can attract things like tourism and stuff like that, right? When you show your differences, then we attract things like tourism. Our comparative is that on our side, we are able to complete and create more structural change that affects the imperialism that makes these countries like unable to self defend And that's why these guys are extremely problematic. The reason we take today's debate is fairly simple. We are the ones who show the true problem with African countries. Number one, instability, which is the which is the, the, the which is stemmed from the fact that they are unable to have long-lasting and sustainable sustainable forms of identity. It's not enough that opening government proves this. They need to be able to show how they are able to solve these things. But the whole shows how sustainable Pan-Africanism is as a national identity. Second thing we show structurally, right, is the problem, is the reason why these institutions are largely redundant. First of all, we show that the voter base does not feel that this is a problem enough because they feel that we all need to focus on our, on our unique problems and they neglect the fact that the reason why they are suffering is because of the white man. In our world, we make these things more apparent to them and they're likely to vote for politicians that are pushing for more coordinated forms of international bodies and that means that we are more likely to have consensus in terms of international bodies when these countries should vote against the white man. They will be proud to come from the closing government. <laughs> I'd like to thank the government whip for his fine speech, and I'd like to call upon the opposition whip to close off the case for closing opposition. Starting with OG. They say internal conflict is problematic. Let me tell you why it doesn't happen. Note opening opposition. Don't explain why the idea of one gun is likely, meaning we're going to be robu more robust uh, to opening government's case. So, firstly, why doesn't it happen? Note we're defending the status quo, meaning that this has been taught for some time, meaning that it's very likely people already buy into this narrative. Secondly, note politicians to consolidate power, they usually use national identity, meaning they try to unify people. Note this looks like literally promoting the national anthem, one song that unites us. This is literally watching World Cup games over the same national television. This is uh, uh, talking about your language that you share that make you, uh, makes you individual. So notice uh, actually that because of these reasons, it's very likely that you're not going to have internal conflict because people love uh, each other. If I'm from Dalmatia and Croatia, and if I'm from Zagori, it's still pretty much the same country. We sh uh, share the same anthem, we root for the same football nation on the World Cup, meaning we're uh, very likely to have this uh, being effective and not so on. But note, secondly, 
They say perfect representation is impossible. This is exactly what happened on this side. And our point about backlash actually interacts here because some people think they are the trade-off. Know the difference. This is more significant on opening government because you have a cognitive dissonance from what your parents say and from what the state promotes in school, meaning it is likelier that you're going to feel uh, being traded off, meaning it's more likely you're going to cause it in, uh, internal conflicts because you're going to have populist politicians that are going to say they're ignoring you, they're not teaching about our shared history in school, and therefore it's more likely that it's going to happen there. We flip this argument, we're already over them. Secondly, what do they say? They say that pretty much unity is important. I don't really know why it's so important to that extent from the whole Pan-African. They try to just have the economic interest. Note, they say exactly the same. Note, look at, for example, Croatia and Serbia are pretty much the biggest trade partners in the status quo. Note, this answer is going to be far better than what opening opposition gives because they just say, oh, this is a fact, this is true. Let me give you some reasons on why this is true. Firstly, proximity. You're pretty much, this is your neighboring country, meaning shipping is the cheapest, meaning you have an active incentive as an average person to do this. B, these policies are made by the government, made by individual people or corporations like the Ministry of Economics. That means that I don't really get an explanation on why does the average person need to believe in this unity in order for these policies to happen. I think this is better than just saying this is fact and this is actually where we get uh, logical priority and note this rebuts closing government's uh, interaction point as well, meaning that this is likely com uh, uncomparative to that point. Moving on to closing government. So first, the most important thing is that parents tell you you're Ghanaian, meaning that the school doesn't on their side as they say. Why is this important? This is important because you're probably more likely to believe your parents because they're the people you interact with most. They're your authority when you're a child. What does this mean? This means that they should actively or they will actively be pissed because the school is ignoring your identity. They say, don't trust the school. And note, this is very important because the impacts are very big. This is literally the decreasing of education because people don't want to learn these subjects. So you're not incentivized by your parents to be a good student. This means it is far less likelier that you're going to get a, a better paying job. It is far less likelier that you're going to be informed or even want to be politically active, meaning at that point, you're much less likely as an African to satisfy your own preferences, meaning that this is the ultimate point within this debate and why we way over. But secondly, note, this screws over OG uh, because the idea of internal conflict is then symmetric and it is legitimately a backstab because OG don't show why schools would be the tipping point on actually causing internal conflict. They say that this narrative exists on both sides of the house. At that point, conflict exists on opening government as well, if you actually believe this. Secondly, moving on to imperialism. Note, the, uh, you need to explain on the suffering because pretty much the West is to blame. Note, like, note you're still then less likely to accept help on uh, closing government. Why? Because you see them as, and you demonize them within this narrative by their own word, meaning that pretty much it's less likely that you're going to have uh, uh, FDI, it's less likely that you're going to have IMF, it's less likely that you're going to even try to export to them. And note another piece of rebuttal that is pretty much very important. People still learn about colonialism in each and uh, every uh, respective country. Pretty much saying it's bad and so on. Note, pretty much, I, as a Croatian, learn about Ovčara more. Bosnians learn more about Srebrenica. If I was a, a Dutch colony and I was a British colony, at the point where someone says, you were abused by Serbia, that's the point I'm still going to have the same cognitive or emotional response because they are not necessarily identical, but you still learn about colonialism on, uh, on uh, closing opposition. This is important to the extent because it co-opts all of their exclusive benefits, pretty much, because uh, people and th these things are so easily uh, implemented on their side of that uh, in, uh, on that side meaning you still have the incentives to, to cooperate because your history is shared it is different to some extent but you still have the same root cause and I don't see why it can't be explained and why the tipping point would be to have this on our motion I'll take <coughs>
the concern of cognitive dissonance still happens on your side. They ask why they spent three chapters on one king that relates to one elite ethnicity and tribe within that nation, but marginalized the other kings. I already, already, it's late to mechanize I already answered this by the extent that this has already been happening for some time, pretty much, meaning that it is very likely that the majority of people are going to buy into this narrative. Like, just thinking about, we share the same language, we watch the same World Cup game, we root for each team, I think it's very clear that uh, this won't happen to the extent that they try. Finally, weighing with opening opposition. So we actually explain how national identity in school and how it is learned looks like. No, this is what actually gives us logical priority to their impact. Secondly, we show on internal security what the duty of the state is and why you're more likely to uh, achieve your subjective definition of happiness at the point where you get to buy into this narrative more. Meaning that you're more likely to buy into uh, education, meaning it's more likely that you're not uh, going to avoid brain drain and just thinking it's the same if I'm here or in any other African country and then just go to the richest one, perpetuating the differences economically and weakening your country, weakening the opportunities that your fellow uh, citizens or people that you uh, trust have, meaning it's far less, uh, it's far more important simply because we get more development on our side. And note, they needed to prove why the perception of Africa uh, changes in the West. I think at the point where they don't, this is far more important simply on likelihood, meaning that we can uh, outweigh. It's a very easy job to call. Thanks. <laughs>